Good morning, everybody. How you doing today? You guys doing good? Come on, turn to your neighbor right now and tell him I'm doing so good. Just tell him I'm doing so good. It's great to have you. Welcome. You came through the rain. We want to welcome all of you who are watching online. Come on, let's give it up for our online campus as well. We love you guys so very much. And we also have our Shoreline South campus. Come on, give it up for Shoreline South. It's great to have you with us. This is graduation Sunday, and I forgot to make this announcement, so I want to make sure everybody knows, but we have a reception uh, after the service today for all of our graduates and their parents in the chapel, an opportunity to take some pictures, get some refreshments, and uh, just uh, honor and celebrate your accomplishments. So please join us in the chapel after our service is concluded um, today. Really excited about next week. We're going to be celebrating Memorial Day weekend and honoring those who have made the ultimate sacrifice. It's going to be a very, very special service. You're not going to want to miss it. And, uh, and so we, we are, we're just excited. Let's all of us stand to our feet. We're going to do what we do every single week here. We wrap our understanding around a collection of phrases that we call our Shoreline Creed. It just helps to remind us that Christianity is all about grace. If you're new to Shoreline, you can read along. And the rest of us, let's uh, say this with some enthusiasm and passion. By the way, um, I met a couple today uh, in the lobby. He's a, uh, he's a neurosurgeon and she uh, is an entrepreneur and they just got married on Friday. And so I was asking them, you know, why are you at church on Sunday when you just got married on Friday? And this kind of blew me away. Honestly, it was just unbelievable. They said, well, we planned our honeymoon. We're leaving on on a flight this afternoon, on Sunday afternoon. They're leaving on a flight and uh, they're going to some, you know, island off the coast of India. It takes two days to get there. But they said, we didn't want to leave until after we came to church. Is that dedication? Come on, that's, that's like mind blowing awesomeness right there. Anyway, uh, we're going to recite our Shoreline Creed together. If you're new, you can read along. The rest of us, we say this with some enthusiasm and passion. And if they could wait for their honeymoon until Sunday, then you guys can be enthusiastic and share this creed with passion. You guys ready? Okay, here we go. I am loved by God. I cannot earn it. I cannot lose it. I am forgiven and made brand new. In Christ, I live with passion and purpose. I am empowered by the Spirit to be the church in the world and to live this love revolution. Come on, let's give God praise for that. Okay, you may be seated. So we are in a collection of talks around the topic of how we can live our best life, how we can live today the very best way that we can live. And I came across this passage of scripture in the Old Testament. It's kind of like a, you know, hidden little, you know, verse that you wouldn't pay much attention to, but it's going to have a lot to do with how we can learn the skills we need to learn in order to live our best life. It's about a group of warriors that were the fiercest and the bravest in all of Israel. And they had a unique skill set. And we're going to pick up this story here in First Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 2. All of them were expert archers and they could shoot arrows or sling stones with their left hand as well as their right. They were all relatives of Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. Okay, that's it. A simple verse of scripture describing the fiercest and bravest of the Israeli warriors who had this unique ability to fight with their right hand as well as their left. And when I came across this passage and I was thinking about it, I thought, wow, what gave them the ability to fight as well with their left hand as with their right? Studies show that most you know, people are right-handed just as a way of, you know, making that point. How many of you are right-handed here today? Let me see you, all of your hands. Okay. How many of you are left-handed? Let me see your hands. Okay. Just a fraction. Okay. Uh, there's only a small percentage of people that are left-handed versus right-handed, but there's even a smaller percentage of people that are truly ambidextrous. They have the ability to, 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 to write or, or to, 
um, or to do things equally with their left and their right hand. Only 1% of the population falls into that rare category. We see that played out in things like baseball, right? If you go to a baseball game, you'll see switch hitters. That's not you know, completely rare. You'll see them on a baseball team. They'll, they'll swing uh, right-handed if they're facing a certain pitcher. They'll swing left-handed. But there still is a dominant side to their skill set. Um, but they just trying to work on it and work at it so that they can be reasonably good from both sides of the plate. But pitchers, you never see pitchers right-handed or left-handed. You don't see that. It's only happened once in all of Major League Baseball. There is a dominant side to every single person. So when you think about these particular soldiers, you have to ask yourself, how did they get so skilled that they could actually use their right hand and their left hand with equal amounts of aptitude? How could they do that? And, uh, and, and if you think about it, you'd have to say, wow, they must have practiced really hard. To become an expert archer, it takes a lot of practice. To become an expert archer using your right hand and your left hand takes 10 times the amount of practice. Think about it. I mean, I can barely drink a cup of tea with my left hand, man. I always use the right hand. One time I rented a car over in Europe where they drove on the wrong side of the road and I had to use the stick shift with my, with my left hand. It was a miracle I survived. And yet here we have people who are fighting equally with their right or the left hand. How did they get that way? They practiced and they didn't just practice. They practiced really hard hard. I think it was Vince Lombardi that said his practice doesn't make perfect. It's perfect practice that makes perfect. And these warriors all from one tribe. It's interesting. The Bible actually uh, gives three references to left-handed people and all of them have military significance. And every single time they describe left-handed warriors or these right and left-handed warriors, they all come from one tribe the tribe of Benjamin. Now think about that for a moment. How did the other 11 tribes respond to this unique skill set that the one tribe of Benjamin had? Did they do what we sometimes do? Did they try to justify, you know, their lack of ability by saying somehow they've got this genetic ability to do what they do or somehow try to make excuses, uh, you know, for their own lack, you know, by by saying that there are other reasons for their success. But if you boil it down, what probably happened is that the Benjamin tribe with blisters on their fingers practiced while the other tribes perhaps were scrolling through their Instagram, Insta, Instagram, you know, trying to figure out their Twitter downloads, you know, maybe binge watching Netflix or get, getting some extra Z's. You got 11 tribes that aren't doing all that much. And then you've got this fierce warrior tribe that has the ability to fight equally with their left as with their right. And it's to make a point. If we're going to live our best life, we have got to be committed to doing the natural and allowing God to do the super. We do the natural, God does the super, and together we get supernatural. God never intended for you to live an ordinary life. He intended for your life to be supernatural but you've got to be willing to do the natural and then God does the super and together it makes supernatural. Those Benjamites, they weren't just miraculously blessed by God with the ability to shoot with the right and with the left. They presented their natural and God made them supernatural. They did the hard work. They were disciplined. They were focused. They were diligent. They perhaps woke up early and blisters on their fingers. They figured it out and God gave them the strength and God gave them the ability. But at the end of the day, it was a partnership. 
man doing the natural, God doing the supernatural, women doing the natural, God doing the supernatural. We started uh, last week, we talking uh, just a, a little bit about how we can live our best life. And we talked about the you know, different, you know, marks of time that the Bible uh, speaks of. There are seasons and then there are other, you know, dimensions of time. We've got weeks and we've got months and we've got years on one side and we've got hours and we've got minutes and we've got seconds on the other side. And, and the Bible actually addresses both the seasons that are a moment like a flash, like, like, like lightning and also the seasons that are more extended. But overall, the Bible, you know, speaks almost exclusively about a period of time called today. 24 hours. Jesus taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread, right? This 24 hour period of time is really, really important. How can we make the most out of this 24 hour period of time? Well, we've got to do the natural in order for God to do the supernatural. I want to take a couple of minutes to unpack that. And then I'm going to give you a life hack. I want to give you a specific skill that I want you to embrace today and apply it to your life because it will have everything to do with you living your best life each day. So let's take a couple of minutes and just unpack this idea of the natural and the supernatural. Because when you read through the Bible, you'll see this combination. It goes all the way back into the garden. When God created mankind, men and women, and put them in the garden, he gave them the freedom to choose and forever linked his relationship with mankind in a partnership. Mankind would do some things. God would do other things but there was always this connection, our part and God's part. Even some of the most supernatural things that you read about in the Bible, you're gonna see a natural part and a supernatural part. Think about the promised land, right? The promised land means everything to the children of Israel. When you read through the Old Testament, you gotta understand it's the promised land that's like the focal point of all of the activity of the Old Testament. It was God calling Abraham to the promised land. It was then identifying what the promised land was all about. And then the rest of the Old Testament seems to be all about the children of Israel conquering the promised land, losing the promised land, winning the promised land back. It was so core and significant to who the children of Israel are and were that even now, 2000 years later, thousands of years later, it's still in the front and center of world politics. What happens in that land is reverberating literally all around the world, even today. So if this thing is so significant, how do you think it happened? Well, let me give you the story. God calls Abraham from just some random place on planet Earth and says, Abraham, I'm going to take you to the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land that I have designed for you to have. And Abraham says to God, well, uh, uh, where is it? And God says, trust me, you'll know it when you get there. I'm going to show you. I'm going to lead you. And it's going to be a beautiful thing. But at the end of the day, you'll know it when you get there. You know what's really remarkable to me is how much natural is in this supernatural interaction between God and Abraham. Because God says, okay, Abraham, you gotta go to the promised land. And God says, and Abraham says, okay, I'll go. He packs his bags, gets his family together, and he begins the journey to the promised land. It's almost comical how it all turns out because they get to this area of the world that God must have had in mind for the promised land, but the specifics are really interesting how it all unfolds. Abraham and Lot are traveling together and they've got so many servants and so much cattle and so many you know, sheep and so on 
that Abraham turns to Lot and says, you know what, let's not fight. You know, we're, your servants are, you know, messing with our servants and we're just so crowded in this, in this confined space. Abraham says to Lot, you choose which direction you wanna go. If you go left, I'm gonna go right. If you go right, I'm gonna go left. So Lot, you know, kind of perks up, you know, does a little bit of survey and sees some land that, that perhaps is green and, and flourishing and says, I'm gonna go left. And Abraham says, fine, you go left and I'll go right. And you know what? When Abraham went right, that is where the promised land became. It wasn't even Abraham's choice. It doesn't seem like it's even God's choice. It seems like it's Lot's second choice that becomes the promised land. What point am I trying to make? There was some real natural in this supernatural experience. And if you go on to read about Abraham, he actually walked out the dimensions of the promised land. And I think to myself, well, what if he just walked out, you know, a couple of square miles? Maybe that's all the promised land would have been. He walked out the land and God said, wherever your feet tread, that's the land I'm gonna give you and it'll be the promised land. A natural, supernatural combination that perfectly fulfilled God's plan in the world. I just want you to recognize that there's a natural and a super in every single one of us. You read through the stories of the Bible. I mean, there was a story about a woman who was at the end of a rope. She had no money. All she had was a small little glass of oil and she was gonna bake some bread and then she was gonna die because she was starving. She had nothing left. And she went to the prophet and the prophet said, I want you to gather as many jars as you can. And when she gathered the jars, the prophet told the woman, I want you to pour out of your small little flask into those jars. And when she did, even though this small little jar was small and these vases that she collected were large, she was able to pour into every single one of those vases out of the oil of that small flask until all of them were full and she was able to sell them at a profit, pay off all of her debts and live comfortably on God's provision. She did the natural, collecting the vases. God did the super and we have a supernatural experience. What if the woman said, oh, you know what? I don't even believe what you're saying. And she just gathered, you know, like three or four jars. She would have got a three or four jar miracle. But she believed what the prophet said and she searched everywhere and got as many jars as she possibly could. And God honored that, the natural and the super. We have a story of Moses who's standing in front of the Red Sea. And, and you might think, you know, that Moses' part to play in this story is really small, but it's still a part. You got the Egyptians coming up on the backside. You got the children of Israel caught between two mountains. And in front of them is the Red Sea. Everybody's fearful. Everybody's complaining. And Moses turns to God and says, you got to work a miracle. And what does Moses, uh, what does God tell Moses? Stretch out your staff in front of the Red Sea. And Moses stretches out his staff and God parts the water. Would you agree that's a supernatural experience? I mean, that's supernatural. But what if Moses would have said, ah, what in the world? Holding a staff before a sea, what good is that? What if he would have just thrown the staff down? We don't know. Because that's not how it happened. Moses did his small part and God did the big part but there's natural and supernatural. Peter had to get out of the boat before he can walk on water. The man with a withered hand had to stretch it forth before the healing came. In almost every story of the Bible, you'll see the natural and then the super that forms the supernatural. In case you're not convinced, I wanna share with you this story. I know it's a little bit you know, uh, lengthy, a few verses for all of us to read together, but it's a fun story. It's a great story. It's found in Acts chapter 12 and starting here in verse five. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Just notice, Peter's in prison, the people are praying. 
What's going to happen next is a miracle. It's absolutely a stunning miracle. But I wonder if it would have happened if the church didn't pray. But they prayed and then God moved natural and super. The night before Herod was to bring them to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. He was bound with two chains. Sentries stood at the entrance. And then suddenly an angel from the Lord appeared and light shone all around the cell. How many of you think that if an angel shows up, that's supernatural? It is. He struck Peter on the side. Apparently angels do that. Kicked him. Wake up. And the chains fell off of Peter's wrists and the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And Peter followed him out of the prison, but had no idea whether what the angel was doing was a vision, a dream, or if it was reality. They passed the first and the second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself and went through it. And they walked the length of one street. And then suddenly the angel left him. Think about this for a moment. The angel shows up. Apparently, this is in the job description of an angel. They'll kick you to wake you up. They will, they will work some kind of magic where the chains fall off. The cell door swings open. The gates to the city swing open by themselves. Apparently, this is in the job description of an angel, but what isn't in the job description is to help Peter get to his feet because the angel says, stand up. What isn't in the job description of an angel is to dress him. He's got to put on his own clothes. He's got to put on his own shoes. And notice the angel does not carry Peter out of the prison cell on his back. He says, follow me. So apparently there's some things that angels do. Loose the chains, open the prison gates, open the city gates, wake you up. But there's also some things you got to do for yourself. You got to put on your shoes. You got to put on your clothes. You got to put on your jacket and you've got to follow. That's the natural that makes the supernatural. And this idea of the natural and the supernatural working together is everywhere in the Bible. You can't find a miracle that there wasn't some natural component to God's supernatural involvement. And you think about life, your life. There's the natural and the supernatural. You think about the, the Benjamite archers. Yeah, God gave them strength. Yes, God gave them tenacity. Yes, God filled them with courage. But there was a lot of practice to be as good with the right hand as with the left. That came with blisters. That's the natural to the supernatural. And in all of life, we see that unfolding. You know what? You know, I, I'm, so, I'm so happy to tell you, Laura and I are celebrating tomorrow 35 years of marriage. <laughs> 35 years. I know, I know, I know some of you are thinking, there's no way you've been married for 35 years. Yeah, we got married when we were 15. <laughs> married for 35 years. Those of you who have been married for 35 years or more will know that that's supernatural. You don't stay married for 35 years without God's grace. Because if God's grace is not involved in a relationship, it usually ends in murder. <laughs> 35 years. Tomorrow we'll be celebrating 35 years. God did supernatural things all throughout our journey. But you know what? There's also some natural things we had to do. Cameras, if you would just kind of follow me, follow me over here for a second. You're the most beautiful woman my <laughs> eyes have ever seen. Mm. 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 <laughs> That's the natural. Supernatural is happening a little later. <laughs> I, 
I've shared this story before, but it's, it's really, it's, it's, what I'm, it's what I'm talking about. A little fluster. You know, when we were when first married, first couple of years, you know, I would always kiss Laura before I would leave for work. Do I have got lipstick all over my mouth? So, I, and I would, uh, you know, one, one time I was just really late and I was running behind. And so I just shouted out, she was upstairs. I'd shout out, uh, Laura, consider yourself kissed. And then I, I went to work and came back and, you know, usually there would be dinner, but there was no dinner. And she said, consider yourself fed. That, that's a true story. That's a, not all my stories are true, by the way, but that one is a true, true story. That feistiness, I love that about her. But the truth is, is that there are some things you need to do. Thinking about kissing somebody, saying you're going to kiss somebody is not the same as kissing somebody. There's a natural and then there's a super that makes the natural supernatural. You got to do your part. God does his part. You got to pray as if everything depended on God, but you got to work as if everything depended on you. And that combination together makes miracles happen. It's how we should parent our children, trusting God with their future and praying for God's protection, but also bringing them to church and teaching them and training them. You think about your health. You know, we, we believe in miracles here at Shoreline. We pray for miracles to happen here at Shoreline. After every service, we give people the opportunity to pray. And many times they're praying for healing. We believe that God still does miracles today. That's the super. But you know what? We also believe in the importance of the natural, of living a healthy life. I do what I can to keep my body strong and healthy. And I also pray for God's miraculous provision in my life. Do you, do you know that Laura, she's a doctor, and so we do this supplement kind of routine. Do you know that she feeds me like 25 pills a day? I took a picture last night. The AMR is for morning Rob. The PM is the evening Rob. I don't know, there's like 18 in the morning and 15 in the evening. If I die, I give all of you a permission to do an autopsy. I want to know what was in those pills. With all the pills I'm taking, I ought to live to 150. But you get the point. There's a natural and there's a supernatural. You think about all of the graduates that we celebrated here today. These graduates, they're awesome. They're amazing. Many of them had to overcome lots of obstacles to get to the graduation stage. Maybe for some it was a cakewalk, but some had to work really, really hard and they prayed and they depended upon God. And then God worked a miracle. I think about my son-in-law who's sitting over here on the left and, and he graduated this year with honors from Southwestern University right here in, in Georgetown. And he did that in his second language. I barely graduated in my first. <laughs> when I was a student, you know, I would pray these sometimes ineffective prayers. I would pray, Lord, help me. I didn't study. I need a miracle. When maybe a better prayer would have been, Lord, give me the strength to do what I need to do and then bring back to my remembrance what I put inside that's more honoring of what I'm talking about here today. But so often I would just pray, Lord, make up for what I lazily didn't do. And I'd get a C. And praise the Lord. We've got our part and God's got his part. Can I hear a good amen? Amen. Now here, let's focus in the final few minutes that we have together on the skill that I wanna encourage you to embrace in light of everything we've been talking about. Think about 24 hours of time and think about how important it is to do the natural in order for God to do, this, to do the super. And here's what I want every single one of us to embrace here today. It's gonna to sound extremely natural and practical, but I promise you it has supernatural implications. What I wanna encourage all of you to do is embrace this skill. Harness the power of healthy 
rituals. Honor, harness the power of healthy customs, healthy habits, healthy rituals. Healthy customs are found all throughout the Bible. In fact, Job chapter one and verse five, it was custom for Job to start his day with prayer. Mark chapter 10, verse one, as was his custom, Jesus taught them. Luke chapter four and verse 16, as was his custom, he went to the synagogue. Acts chapter 17, according to Paul's custom, he went to them and reasoned with them from the scriptures. Customs, another way of saying rituals, another way of saying habits are all throughout the scripture verses. This is what natural human beings did. This was the natural expression of their devotion to God that God took and made super. And I want to challenge every single one of you to start every 24 hour period of time with some healthy rituals. Let me unpack that for just a couple of minutes. What does that look like? Well, I don't think that there's a wrong or a right. I just think you need to make it good for you. Some people might think, you know what? The first thing I need to do in order to start my day well is to raise my heart rate with exercise. Someone else might say, maybe my healthy ritual is to start every day lowering my heart rate with meditation. For someone else, it might be a walk. For someone else, it might be taking out a journal and expressing some gratitude. One person said that the key to being productive and successful is to simply make your bed every time you got out of bed. In fact, you might be surprised on who that was. It was Rear Admiral William McRaven, a graduate from the University of Texas who actually spoke these words at a commencement address not too long ago. He challenged every single graduate from UT to simply make their bed. He observed from his life in the military, he was the highest ranking special ops officer in the United States military. He was responsible for the Navy SEALs program. And he observed over his lifetime in the military that one of the most important things that people could do was start each day with a victory. And when he saw that men and women in the armed forces would literally make their bed every morning. It was that simple, healthy ritual that gave them a win before anything else happened during the day. When I read that, it reinforced something that's been a part of my life now for a little while that I can honestly say is one of the most important skills I've ever adopted in my life. And that is to start every single day with some healthy rituals. For me, some of them take mere seconds, others maybe a little bit more time, but there are seven things that I wanna do every single day when I get up. I wanna brush my teeth. And Laura said, amen. I wanna drink some water. I wanna take my morning supplements, drugs, whatever they are. I want to work out. I want to stretch. I want to meditate because that's when I'm most ready for the most important thing in my life to have my devotions. That's the order. There's no magic to my order and there's no magic to the number seven. It's just what I've learned that I can actually start every single day with seven victories before anything else happens. A healthy ritual. And if you think you're overwhelmed by what I do, think about Mark Wahlberg. Have you ever heard of Mark Wahlberg? He's that like famous Hollywood movie star. His healthy ritual starts at 2.30 in the morning. And he wakes up and he spends some time in prayer. And then he works out, takes a shower, has breakfast, works out again, takes another shower, has another breakfast, and then goes on to make blockbuster movies. Of course, he goes to bed at 730, but that's his ritual. And I know some of you are feeling really overwhelmed right now and thinking, there's no way I can barely get out of bed in the morning. 
You want me to include some activity? Maybe the most you've ever thought about your wake up time is how you can get out the door with enough time to show up to work on time. And I'm just encouraging you to harness for a moment this very scriptural idea of starting your day with some victories, doing the natural so God can do the supernatural. And some of you might be thinking to yourself, I don't have the time in the morning. Well, maybe you need to begin thinking about how you go to bed at night. Maybe your ritual needs to start at sundown versus sun up. You say, well, that's a novel idea. No, no, it's a very scriptural idea. It comes straight from the way the Jewish people would live their life. Their day didn't start in the morning. It started at sundown the day before. And you see this rhythm even in creation itself. We read the scriptures about how God created the world and notice the sequence. There was evening and there was morning and a new day unfolded. Evening was the start. Morning was midway. We ignore that rhythm to our peril. We need to start at night. And for Laura and I, that means evaluating how we spend our evenings. And we try to manage our lives and so we can get to bed on time, so that we can get up on time, so we can start with some of those healthy rituals because we've noticed in our lives that there's something really supernatural that happens when we embrace some of these natural skill sets that the Bible talks about. How do we become who God wants us to become if we're not willing to engage in doing our part so he does his part, the natural and the supernatural. I'm going to ask uh, for Joel to come on out and help us close here today. I notice a huge difference in my life when I start with some victories. And I know that not every day goes according to plan. Matter of fact, more times than I could ever tell you, things get off track. Sometimes things happen late at night and I can't get my evening routine and that affects how things happen in the morning. Sometimes things happen in the morning. I mean, what we got kids to raise, right? That'll offset a lot of things. If you got kids, you got a dog that barks all night. You got traffic jams that keep you from getting to work. You got issues, I know. For the things that you don't control, there's a serenity prayer and you can look that up some other time. But for the things that you do control, that's what I'm talking about here. And for most of us, we can control what our night looks like and what our morning looks like. Get rid of the things that don't produce fruit. Establish some healthy boundaries. God never called you to live an ordinary life. He called you to milk out of 24 hours the very best you can every single day day. And I think it starts with some healthy rituals. Find them. See what God would lead you to do and embrace them every day. My dad had a ritual when we were going on vacation. He would open up the doors to our bedroom and he would sing at the top of his voice a song in Dutch. Weet je niet op stand of bleef je maar liggen? Weet je wat niet? Weet je wat komt? He would sing that song at five in the morning, and none of us wanted to hear it. Weet je niet op stand of bleef je maar liggen? Weet je wat niet? Weet je wat komt? You know what those words are? If you don't get up and you stay sleeping you're going to miss what is to come. Those words, I didn't want to hear it, but I always knew that something great followed those words. Vacation, joy, new sights, new experiences. You know what? God wants you 
to develop your own set of healthy rituals so you can live your best life. You think about these brave, fierce Benjamites, these ambidextrous warriors. They didn't become fierce because they won the genetic lottery. They became fierce because they did their natural and God did the super. Could I hear a good amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity just to be together here today. And I pray that you would elevate in each and every one of us the desire to make each 24 hour period of time special and beautiful and glorifying to you. All throughout the pages of scripture, Father, you have partnered with us, a natural and a supernatural that makes the supernatural happen. So Father, I pray that you would show us and lead us how to live our lives for your glory. In Jesus' name. If you wouldn't mind just remaining in an attitude of prayer for just a moment longer, if you came to church today and you're not where you need to be with God, by the way, you did something natural. You came to to service today so that God can do something super. Those of you watching online, you, you had to go through some some hoops to even experience this service today. But you did the natural so that God can do the super in your life. If you're here today and you're not right with God, you say, Pastor, I'm not living right. I'm not doing right. I'm not where I ought to be with God. I need prayer. Maybe you made a decision at one point in time, but you slipped away. And today you want to rededicate your life to serving him. Or maybe you've never invited Jesus into your heart. Let's never forget that the gospel is the celebration of God's amazing grace for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. If you're here today and you're not where you need to be with God, you'd say, Pastor, I need prayer. Whether to meet him for the first time or rededicate your life to serving him, I want you to raise your hand quickly wherever you are. Wonderful, God bless you with all of your hands raised. I wanna lead you in a very special prayer. I'm sure many of you at home are feeling the need to connect with God. And so I'm, going to lead you in a very simple prayer. And I want you to pray this prayer out loud after me. Everyone who raised your hands, but also everyone that's here as a reaffirmation of your faith in God, let's all of us pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending Jesus. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive me of all my sins. I put my trust in you. And I will live for you from this day forward by your power for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you give them all a great big hand clap? If you prayed that prayer um, at home, we want you to let us know by just emailing us at prayer at shoreline.net. If you prayed that prayer here, we want to encourage you after we're closed uh, with the blessing, just to go ahead and and be seated again. And some of our prayer partners right here uh, will help you and give you some information that'll really help you. You can download this QR code. By the way, this QR code is kind of a new thing and you've probably been hearing us talk about it. You know, we were giving out so many numbers. You know, if you want to give, you text this number. If you want to be a guest, you text this number. And, you know, people had to really figure out the, the number and then type it in correctly. And some of you were sending your guest cards to First Baptist. We got tired of that. So we got a scan now that's super easy. You can just use your phone and scan down the information and uh, it'll help you in every, in every way. Uh, whether you're online to give or to give us your, your guest information or to give us prayer requests or to serving opportunities. And by the way, after the service is done today, we do have some folks out there in the lobby. If you do want to serve, we want to encourage you to serve. And then don't forget, graduates, we have that reception for you in the chapel. Let's all of us stand to our feet. We're going to close with this blessing that comes from Numbers chapter 6. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face to you and give you peace. God bless you. Have a fantastic rest of your Sunday. And we look forward to seeing you next week. God bless.